our beautiful people of Africa, it's another exciting moment for us to be together to discuss issues of utmost importance of that concern of the uh, African continent. And our focus this day is on the uh, uh, alliance of uh, Sahel states, particularly Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger, looking at how these countries can take advantage or can uh, actually uh, benefit from this confederation that we want to look at how they can, uh, you know, analyze the, the competitive advantage and intelligence. Uh, so today's edition of Global Insight on for you, Media Africa focuses on the Alliance of Sahel State, which was formed on uh, the 16th of September 2023, and now Confederation of the uh, Alliance of Sahel State, a new regional alliance formed by uh, the uh, revolutionary nations, as I call them, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger. In the course of this program, we're supposed to understand the competitive advantage and intelligence of this uh, uh, look at the time that the African continent is actually becoming more and more attractive to foreign powers. This confederation actually marks a significant departure from their uh, former ties with ECOWAS and a strategic shift, especially in its uh, diplomacy. This move has been held across Africa, with some pundits suggesting that it's a greater milestone toward the complete liberation from the French colonial rule and persistent terror threat supported by the colonial power to keep its influence and geopolitical uh, control in the Sahel. So today, we continue to explore the uh, analysis or the, the competitive advantage of these uh, confederations uh, formed by the Alliance of Sahel State and the implications of this on the geopolitical uh, realignment in West Africa. What are the prospects for the new uh, development? If you are just tuning in, you're most welcome to Global Insider this day. I'll be taking you straight away to Abuja in Nigeria. We're being joined by Otto David in his capacity as international security expert. Welcome to the Pan-African Television for you, Media Africa, Otto David. Yes, um, uh, thank you for having me on your program. Uh, thank you to your guest uh, for uh, uh, taking the time to uh, listen to this program. So we hope that uh, it is going to be enjoyable, uh, but more so we are thinking about uh, the, um, the relevance in terms of the information that uh, is ongoing now regarding uh, the security and geopolitical space um, within the continent and how that uh, is quite an important subject, you know, that needs to be discussed. So I'm um, yeah, very glad, you know, to be on this uh, on this channel and to share my views. And we appreciate you for accepting uh, our rendezvous this day. Otto David, uh, just to remind us of that uh, Dr. Rashid Perboa, who is uh, the president of the uh, African Parliamentarian uh, Forum on Population and Development, will join us subsequently. And uh, I kick off with you, uh, Otto David. We are looking at uh, the uh, uh, confederation of uh, the uh, Alliance of Sahel States and looking at how uh, they can and gain a competitive advantage uh, that will meet the aspirations of the people of this region and Africa in uh, particular. So let's first of all understand holistically uh, what uh, confederation depicts in the context of uh, the uh, three countries in the Sahara region. Well, I think, you know, generally, uh, I think it's important to understand that um, you know, countries have in the past and, and in the present, you know, formed uh, alliances. Um, you know, so for example, uh, you had the likes of uh, uh, NATO being established as an alliance, you know, the Northern, um, you know, States Alliance, which included, of course, the likes of the United States, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Um, and then you had um, other, um, you know, what you can still call confederations like the Soviet Union. So these are more or less, um, you know, uh, different countries coming together for uh, perhaps economic 
interest, you know, to share economic interest for purposes of security, um, for purposes of, um, you know, political affiliations, um, regional bodies, you know. So internationally, um, we've had the likes of NATO and uh, uh, the, the likes of the Warsaw Pact, uh, which collapsed, you know, the Soviet Union, which collapsed uh, in the 1990s. Um, then, of course, you have, you know, organizations like the League of Nations that collapsed, you know, formed the United Nations. So these are all leagues, the African Union, the, uh, the AU before, um, you know, the, the Organization of African Unity before, and then now the AU. So within the global setting, um, you know, countries come together to establish, um, you know, these kind of alliances. Um, within Africa itself, you know, driving down towards Africa, we have, you know, six regional bodies, you know, which exist within the continent. You know, for example, uh, we have ECAS, that's Economic Community of Central African States. You know, they are focused more on uh, the economy of, you know, Central African states in terms of the common interests within that region. Then, of course, you have the likes of um, uh, ECOWAS, which is the Economic Community of West African States. You, um, you have, you know, different alliances um, in the uh, in the eastern part of the um, the African continent. You know, you have different alliances within uh, the northern part of Africa. So all these alliances, you know, have been established uh, for the purpose of common interest. You know, so it is not surprising that in the backdrop uh, of the military coup d'etats that occurred in the Sahel uh, from 2020, beginning with uh, Mali, uh, then, of course, Burkina Faso, uh, Guinea-Bissau, uh, um, and, and then, of course, um, Niger Republic and the likes of that, you know, the, the backdrop of these countries uh, being suspended uh, from uh, these regional blocs that they belong to, uh, you know, they belong to ECOWAS. So they were suspended from this block. And you had them also being suspended from the African Union. So when countries that have common interests, you know, find themselves, you know, uh, being suspended, of course, you, I mean, yeah, even globally, you have the likes of the G20. Um, uh, and then, of course, you know, uh, um, you know, other alliances that have been established um, to, you know, to counter that. So it was not a surprise. Uh, to see that after Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger left, um, you know, ECOWAS because they were suspended, they said they were leaving ECOWAS, um, it was just normal that, you know, they established some kind of, uh, uh, um, you know, um, you know, starting from a defense, um, you know, pact, which they call the, uh, the Alliance of Sahel States, um, you know, they created their an Article 5 uh, replica, which automatically said any attack on one of the states will be an attack uh, on all of the states. This was in reference to uh, the threat that ECOWAS made, uh, that it would use military um, in the force to restore the, uh, the overthrow of President Bazoum um, in the case of Niger. So you had that alliance being created, and that or more or less was some kind of a military alliance. So now, in terms of the economy, uh, what these states are doing is that they have now established what they call the Confederation of Sahel States. You know, so it's it's more or less saying that we are not just only going to defend ourselves against um, you know uh, any external threat um, or against any internal um, you know force that threatens the integrity and uh, sovereignty of our states, but we are also going to establish some kind of an economic community. Um, which in this case, you know, would be a confederation. So in my opinion, um, it's more or less they are just replacing, um, you know, what the functions of the likes of ECOWAS used to play uh, in the case uh, of the Sahel states. You know, so this is more or less a confederation that is going to deal with uh, the economy of the, uh, the, tri the three states, Mali, Burkina Faso, and, and Niger, um, the, uh, the diplomatic relationships that they are having, especially with the fact that all these three countries have now kicked out uh, the, the likes of, uh, uh, of France. You know, they've asked the United States to, uh, to vacate in the case of Niger as well. Um, you know, they um, kicked out the, the African 
um, union mission that was existing, the UN mission. Um, so uh, this is some kind of, you know, a, re a reawakening of all these states uh, to now establish some kind of an, an economic um, alliance, you know, so they are creating the alliance of Sahelian states. Um, you know, um, and other countries like um, Senegal, for example, you know, with a new president, uh, is beginning to show some signs of, you know, um, supporting uh, these um, three uh, Sahel states. Uh, of course, Senegal is is, is currently um, uh, a member of the uh, the the ECOWAS, a key member uh, and a very strong ally of France. Uh, before now, perhaps, you know, so the fact that. These three countries are having support, you know, from uh, countries like Senegal. Uh, is a demonstration that there is some kind of a collapse of the, um, you know, the stronghold that countries like France, you know, had on on these continents, especially within the Sahel. Um, so it would, you know, be interesting to see uh, what kind of replacements, you know, um, uh, these countries make. Is it just going to be? Uh, a confederation of these three states? Are we going to see more states uh, joining them? Are we going to see um, external geopolitical friends, you know, the likes of Russia, the likes of China, China coming in to support uh, the capacity and capabilities of uh, the confederation? So it's, it's still growing, uh, and, you know, we, we're still yet to see um, how that is going to shape out uh, in the nearest future going uh, to shape out uh, in uh, the nearest uh, future at all, David. I think uh, this will actually uh, be on a de uh, dependent uh, on the uh, strategy that uh, the uh, uh, the leaders of these uh, three nations have put uh, to, together to meet up with uh, the uh, expected uh, objectives or goals set. Uh, while listening uh, to your deep analysis uh, uh, regarding a uh, topic for discussion, does the and uh, some very peculiar decisions which the leaders of Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger have uh, taken in line to maybe write uh, a new history for the uh, their respective countries, and particularly for the African continent. We want to answer the major uh, question of today, how these countries can capitalize on uh, the competitive advantage and intelligence to solve uh, some of these uh, uh, problems, especially security uh, problems, and also to see how they can uh, use the confederation uh, to bring about a robust in the economy of the respective nations. So what strategies can be uh, advanced to, to capitalize on uh, these advantages? Yes, I think it's important to, um, uh, to note that um, working as a confederation, um, the way that it normally works is that the confederation, of course, is going to be, um, you know, between the three states for now. Um, you know, when it comes to a strategy in terms of advancing, uh, this now depends on the individual mechanisms uh, and that will be put in place uh, by these three states. Um, it is hugely uh, reliant uh, on the resources that they do have and the support uh, that, you know, they can actually gather from not just their population, the people within Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger, but also from external parties. You know, are they going to have friends? Uh, I think it's important uh, to note that these countries have the sovereignty, uh, they have the independence, and, you know, they, they are without that, um, you know, the sole decision makers you know, should they decide to have an alliance? So there is no question uh, in terms of, you know, whether they should uh, be able to have an alliance or not. Uh, because, of course, you know, this is a matter of, you know, sovereignty and a decision uh, that has been made by these three states. So the question now is um, how do they actually go ahead, you know, and initiate um, maybe their security plan? Now, for example, uh, these three countries have already established um, some kind of um, uh, what we call the uh, a replica of the multinational joint tax force, um, a standby force that is going to intervene when there is there are issues of insecurity, especially when it comes to the counter jihadist operation uh, in the Sahel, which affects 
all the three countries. So they have to develop a strategy on that. The argument uh, that they've made is that there hasn't been any difference in terms of the, the capacity and level of attacks that have been happening under the, um, you know, the help of countries like France, uh, the likes of MINUSMA in the case of Mali, uh, the presence of the United States in, uh, uh, in base, uh, Air Base 201 in the case of Niger, um, you know, so, uh, and also the, the presence of multinational forces uh, in the tripartite region of the Liptako Goma, which, of course, um, is the linkage between Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger. So they have argued that all these external forces that have, you know, uh, come to uh, uh, to Niger and uh, come to, uh, to to uh, to to Mali and Burkina Faso, it hasn't made any, uh, you know, practical difference. So by establishing this kind of an alliance, you know, they are able to be able, they are able to kind of counter these forces. But it depends now on the strategy. Are they going to have uh, some kind of uh, uh, you know, a bottom-top approach? Yeah. Is it going to be um, a people-driven uh, approach? Because, of course, security needs to look at the motivational factors. You know, what is motivating people to to join, um, you know, some of these um, uh, Sahel-based uh, terrorist organizations that are linked with ISIS and Al-Qaeda? Mm -hmm. How are they going to deal with the underlying factors? You know, do they have enough resources that is able to remove, you know, some of these people that are vulnerable to being recruited uh, from the ground and to elevate their status in such a way that they do not find uh, these groups to be interesting for them to join. So you've got to look at those, those kind of um, interventions. You've also got to look at how they collaborate. Now, they've complained that uh, the likes of France, you know, were not doing much. Uh, in terms of collaboration, uh, some of the regions um, where the um, French forces were stationed uh, in the northern part of Mali, even the Malian forces could not have access uh, into this region, which was mm -hmm. somehow um, a, a detriment to their sovereignty. So now, how are they going to collaborate um, with the likes of Niger, Mali, or between themselves in such a way that there are no gaps in intelligence, there are no gaps in, in surveillance and reconnaissance missions. So sure. it, it, it has to be a very, um, you know, comprehensive uh, security approach. We haven't seen uh, the roadmap in terms of what is it that they are going to do. Mm -hmm. um, but what we know is that they are saying that the alliance of Sahel states, the defense pact that they've put together, um, the establishment of the confederation is going to be a very a powerful starting point for these three states to coordinate when it comes to security. And, and it is the same, um, you know, when it comes to issues of the economy, um, when it comes to issues of diplomacy, are they all going to align themselves to a particular external party? Um, you know, we know that, uh, for course, example, that, in the case that of That is where the, the problematic uh, lies. Yes, go ahead. Otto David, uh, sorry to interject, but, but I think uh, this question uh, I'm bringing forward will continue to uh, answer the, the questions or make uh, for you to make uh, the point. Uh, now, the question is looking at uh, the, the decisions taken by these uh, uh, revolutionary uh, leaders across uh, the African continent, uh, standing to fight uh, uh, imperialism and neocolonialism and to uh, defend uh, the sovereignty of their respective nations nation in every uh, sphere. Looking at uh, the Russian Federation, how does the strategic alignment uh, of uh, Sahel state with Russia influence the political and uh, economic landscape of the member countries within uh, the uh, alliance of the uh, Sahel state and uh, uh, its confederation? And what are the potential benefits uh, of this uh, shift or even challenges at a time of uh, increased geopolitical battle in Africa among uh, superpowers, particularly Russia, uh, the United States of America, and France that is completely losing it? Yeah, so there are always two sides, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, geopolitics. So on the one side, um, those who are losing ground uh, you know, for example, France, the United States, um, and, and the Western allies, they regard um, the, um, the establishment of the confederation of the Sahel states or the establishment of the, um, 
uh, the, the alliance of Sahel states, they see that as an anti-democratic move. Um, you know, not just that, uh, they, you know, kind of tend to uh, label this approach um, as, you know, against the will and the wishes of the people. Uh, and, of course, this is based on the fact that, you know, these countries are on the losing side. You know, they, um, they are losing territory, uh, they are losing influence, you know, perhaps they are also losing a lot uh, on some of the, um, the benefits that they accrued in terms of mineral resources within this region. So they are actually, you know, putting forward a narrative, uh, which, of course, has some level of support within these countries that, um, you know, uh, we, we, we condemn uh, this, um, you know, so-called revolutionaries because, of course, you know, they, uh, they, they, they took power unconstitutionally. Um, so they're driving this narrative. On the other side, you have these revolutionary leaders, you know, who call themselves, again, revolutionary leaders. Um, they are preaching against the, the, the ills of uh, the colonial um, days. They talk about the fact that countries like France have continuously exploited the country. Uh, they've continuously ripped the country of its mineral resources. They haven't seen any benefits in terms of the, uh, the economy, in terms of the uh, security, in terms of, you know, even democracy hasn't worked. You know, because, of course, some of the leaders have overstayed in power. Some of them, you know, have, you know, changed the constitution to allow them to stay in power. Sure. Uh, some of them are unable to, um, you know, actually deal with the insecurity. And they are using the military and the security services to protect them mm -hmm. uh, and for them to stay in power instead of, you know, actually providing... Um, what the wishes of the people are. So this set of leaders, this set of very young leaders, you know, um, you know, level themselves as revolutionaries, and they are coming up with an alternative. Absolutely. You know, in their regard, they are saying we want to move away from the likes of France. We want to move away from the uh, the colonial legacies, and to do that, they are finding new alliances. And I think perhaps. <laughs> Um, the reason why they are finding new alliances is because there can never be a vacuum. So they are leaning towards the likes of Russia. And, and you know, of course, they are citing the fact that Russia was, in the days of the Soviet Union, very powerful um, in, in fighting and contributing towards um, the, the, um, the colonial wars, state, yeah. you know, helping African countries to uh, fight against colonialism and imperialism. Um, they're saying that Russian, Russia and the likes, you know, the likes of China are actually much better in terms of not, um, you know, uh, really getting themselves into the, the, um, the national, uh, you know, security integrity of the state. You know, they, they aren't actually concerned with, um, you know, changing of power, who becomes the next president of the country. So they, they're having a lot of faith um, in having alternative a support, you know, from the likes of the Soviet Union, you know. So, you know, but there are people who are saying that um, it is either, it is neither um, Russia nor the West. You know, other people are saying that, you know, we should have revolutionary leaders who do not depend um, on any external powers, you know, Absolutely. because, of course, some are saying they are all the same. Um, for now, they might be good today, tomorrow, they might turn out to be the same. So, again, it just depends uh, on how these leaders are analyzing uh, the geopolitical landscape. landscape you know, on the it. one hand, their argument has been very powerful in saying that, you know, even if we have two bad elements, let us go for the lesser evil mm -hmm. um, and abandon the, the much bigger evil. Uh, so it is a matter of choice it, between, you know, who is going to work uh, for the benefit of the country at this point in time, and who is going to lose out because they haven't made any beneficial contributions towards the development um, of the Sahel region. So it's a very fine balance that these so-called revolutionary leaders, you know, are leading. You know, they're talking about some kind of, you know, re reinventing or, or the reinv reinvigoration um, of, you know, the, uh, the Pan-Africanism uh, that, you know, has been talked about by the likes of Kwame Krumah in the 1960s. Yeah. But let's see what kind of plan they have uh, mm -hmm. in terms of sustainability and continuity. 
Absolutely. Because, you know, the truth is that the Western countries, the like of France, the like of the United States, you know, they are not going to go down without a fight. Absolutely, and that means yeah. you know, there, there will be possibilities of sabotage, um, you know, within the, the states. There will be possibilities of, uh, um, you know, other elements. I mean, just yesterday, I know it's, I'm going out of context a little bit in terms of region. Yeah. Um, there were some United States citizens, you know, and Canadian citizens, uh, of course, they are dual nationals who were accused of being amongst, you know, armed men that tried to overthrow the, uh, the president Kinshasa, yeah. uh, of uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, so, you know, the, the, the anti-Western and anti-colonial rhetorics, you know, keep pumping very high. Um, but let's see how the leaders in the continent deal with this in practice. Which is very imperative for uh, what you've highlighted, uh, Otto David. And uh, we're going to continue in uh, the same light. Uh, you talked about uh, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, the, the opinion of people across uh, the African continent and uh, across the global world as, uh, as l at large. I want us to give a clarification about the decisions of these leaders, because uh, leaders uh, in the Mali, uh, Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso uh, being uh, categorical about uh, uh, severing their ties uh, with France and even the United States, uh, is it uh, to you know to review if they have to enter into uh, other alliances or agreements, uh, the terms uh, or maybe how can they define their diplomacy in such a way to uh, that uh, even in the, the long run with uh, the geopolitical landscape uh, changing, they will still be able to. To, to have a, a good diplomatic uh, strategy uh, that will keep the interest of the uh, African continent first before any uh, maybe political interest of leaders? Yes, I think the advantage um, that these leaders have um, is that they are making it very clear, uh, not just to maybe countries like Russia or countries like China, they are making it very clear that they want to see a win-win economic, military, or diplomatic relationship. They want a situation where if, they, if one is benefiting, the other must also be benefiting. I mean, they are saying, in other words, that the relationship that they had with the likes of France uh, and other Western countries has never been beneficial. It has always been about these colonies. They talk about the fact that, um, you know, they do not have control of their fiscal policies. Uh, you know, you have a continent whereby it still uses the uh, the old currency of uh, of France, you know, of course, which France doesn't use. It is now being backed uh, by, the, um, uh, by the euro. Uh, they talk about the fact that, you know, the uh, the, the economic and, and political, but also the language landscape of French, you know, and, you know, other languages has been uh, used to control uh, the mindset of the younger generation. You know, so it, it is a situation whereby, you know, one needs to be able to understand that even though they are moving away from the likes of France to the likes of the United States, it is still a situation of how are they going to manage these new alliances, this new, um, you know, friendship, uh, this new uh, support mechanisms that they've established elsewhere. Um, it is down to some of the contracts, you know, some of the agreements that have been signed before. So I think these are a set of new leaders. Hopefully, um, you know, they will be able to move away from uh, some of the, uh, the bad, um, you know, rhetorics about the fact that, of course, the two power uh, unconstitutionally. Yeah. Um, they are not supposed to be in power. They are supposed to hand over power to a civilian-led government. You know, they have to move away from that because, you know, they still face uh, the pressures of the likes of ECOWAS, the African Union, uh, the international community, uh, the International uh, Monetary Fund. All these regional and international organizations will keep putting pressure uh, on these leaders to relinquish power on the basis that they are not democratically elected. So the question that you've got to ask yourself now is if they sign agreements with these countries that they intend to sign agreements with, what happens after they hand over power to 
a civilian-led government. Absolutely. Would that mean that some of these contracts will then be revoked, just like they are revoking contracts that were signed before by democratically elected governments? You know, so what is permanent in this contract? Does it mean that if, for example, the revolutionary leaders or so-called leaders of um, you know, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger. Niger yeah. What if they hand over power tomorrow? What is the implication of that? Mm -hmm. Does it mean that all these um, relationships that they've established can actually be revoked? So, you know, you've got to look at the dynamics, not just of what is happening today, today. Yeah. but potentially what is going to happen tomorrow in terms of those agreements and those um, uh, alliances that they're establishing, including the alliance of Sahelian states. Okay, thank you for that, uh, uh, Otto uh, Davita. Time to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Rashid Pelpo, who is a president, African Parliamentarian uh, Forum on Population and Development. Uh, doctor, we're going to continue in line uh, with uh, uh, the problematic that Otto David ended with, uh, about, and it brings us to the uh, political rhetorics in Africa and how can we ensure sustainability in the push to be able to solve uh, the major problems that the African continent is facing, particularly on, in uh, defending its sovereignty uh, in all spheres, taking uh, the uh, case study of uh, Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso, should in case uh, they are not at the helm. Will uh, their ideology or philosophy uh, be continued to ensure the total liberation of Africa? Hello, Dr. Rashid. Yeah, Clarice, I thank you so much. And I do appreciate the fact that this is of serious concern and uh, has been subjected to this kind of inter, inter, um, interaction. Um, we will need to interrogate exactly what is happening in the, uh, the AES, the new organization formed by these countries, what has compelled it and why we are going, where they're going, where they are going. Uh, first of all, um, the truth is that these countries are fed up with what they expect from ECOWAS and not getting. The failure of ECOWAS is manifested in the coup d'etat that happened, and their failure is concreted by the fact that they, can't, they couldn't handle the coup d'etat, the coup makers, to the point that they found that ECOWAS itself um, does not represent the true spirit and consciousness of the African and give the direction where we are going as, as African people. Um, essentially, the major problem Africa is facing is not political. It is economic. Our failure to organize ourselves is because we have failed economically to be viable, to be strong, to be in. Oh, unfortunately. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah, that's As a an interruption on yeah. the part of uh, Dr. Hello. Uh, Rashid uh, Pebo. I will come to you uh, subsequently, just to remind our viewers tuning yes. in that this is uh, Global Insight on For You Media Africa. Hello, Dr. Rashid. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I'm saying that our inability to function as African countries, and especially in ECOWAS, mm -hmm. as independent, viable countries, is because we are, we are unequal to reflect the true intent of ECOWAS. We are unable to strengthen our various economies to the point that we can be independent and be, you know, able to take care of our people adequately to avoid all these coup d'etats and the satisfaction of young people and the misery we see every day and the begging, begging spree all over the continent where you have lots of our young people, uh, sorry, our, 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 our leaders going to IMF and World Bank to beg for money and to demean ourselves. I, I think that what the AES has done is a true reflection of what we want in Africa. 
we, we, we cannot continue to be in organizations such as ECOWAS and for them to listen to the West and take decisions for us. We can't continue to be in a situation where in ECOWAS we can have terrorists running down various countries and we cannot help. So you see the ECOWAS country going variously to, give, to seek for help, sometimes going to France. It, imagine the situation of uh, La Côte d'Ivoire. The France had to move in to bring um, in, uh, Ouattara into power. Mm -hmm. The situation of Mali and uh, Niger, where the, 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 the Russia has to come in, the uh, Russian private forces have to come in to support them to against the the intrusion of ECO, uh, sorry, intrusion of terrorists. Yes. So as an independent, as independent countries coming together with an object. Uh, we lost uh, him again. I think I will, I will come to you, Otto or David, uh, with uh, the question similar to what uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Rashid Pebua was uh, actually elaborating on. And we are looking at, he made mention of the economic vulnerability of African states, and that's what makes uh, the, the continent very uh, susceptible, especially uh, to uh, 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 foreign powers. Now, considering the economic uh, vulnerability of these countries, particularly in uh, the uh, Sahel state, where we saw the, uh, you know, the, the the insecurity overshadowing the uh, the economic prowess of the country. What opportunities and obstacles lie ahead of this uh, confederation of uh, uh, state of the, the alliance of uh, Sahel states in terms of fostering economic uh, development and attracting investment to uplift uh, the their population? and reduce insecurity? Well, uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the, the opportunities, it all depends on the plan uh, that the, uh, the, the Confederation of uh, Sahelian States members have. Um, you know, uh, they come at a time when, one, they are leaving ECOWAS. You know, they've made it very clear that, you know, they are leaving ECOWAS, even though uh, ECOWAS has asked them to reconsider so they, they come at a time when it's going to be um, more or less a competitive uh, body that, you know, um, you know would seem uh, ordinarily to other ECOWAS members as a challenge uh, to the existence of ECOWAS. And, of course, ECOWAS is also going to be concerned that if it were to annoy um, any of the members that are left, then it opens up doors for uh, them to simply move uh, to uh, the, uh, the the Sahel uh, Alliance um, state. So, you know, uh, the, the opportunities are there, uh, but the challenges are quite huge as well. So it, it just all depends uh, on the plan. Um, uh, in terms of, you know, um, you know how that, you know, fizzles out uh, in the next uh, couple of months or years to come, um, I, I think, you know, one of the uh, the issues that they will face is funding. How are they going to get funding? Uh, but I'm sure um, that, you know, they already have that as a plan because, of course, you know, um, they know the challenges that have been mm -hmm. faced. But, you know, let's see how it goes. Indeed, it's about uh, seeing how it goes. And uh, uh, Dr. Rashid uh, joined us uh, again. Uh, Dr. Rashid, just to, to uh, align with uh, what you highlighted uh, earlier on, how can uh, we uh, use, you know, the, the politics of Africa uh, be redefined to solve uh, the uh, problems of the continent? Well, the, the, whole, the whole concept and idea of Africa has to be redefined. We have failed to understand that Africa cannot run if we are not independent economically. Africa cannot remain fighting for, fighting politically all our lives. You know, we spend all the time fighting to be independent. We are spending all the time fighting amongst ourselves, fighting corruption. We spend all the time fighting to ensure that there's free and fair elections. We spend all our time trying to ensure that we, we keep our sovereignty, our states, and uh, spend all our time trying to regroup 
We don't know whether the AU is regrouped only politically or there is a sense in it. So much still needs to, be ha needs to happen. No trade is going on in Africa adequate enough for us to have that kind of interaction that will ensure that uh, we don't give ourselves our trade only to the outsiders. No economic, no transportation um, adequacy is going on in Africa. Sometimes you want to travel to one African country, you have to go as far as to France before you can get there, or to another country before you can get back to Africa. I mean, everything doesn't look like we are sure as to exactly what we want. So there's a problem in the whole of confederation, the whole of the configuration of Africa and the conception of what we want to do. So there's so much room left, and interesting parties are coming in in their numbers to take Africa. The way so it's like this is a continent that people don't know what they are, what they want. Europe moves in and takes what they want. Um, America moves in and takes what they want. The Chinese and the Japanese move in and take what they want, and we are continually looking like we are underdogs, begging for money, begging for space, inability to rule, coup d'etats here and there, and, uh, you know, failed economies here and there. So we have to uh, reconfigure exactly what we need. It is not about the politics. We've gone past these politics when we gain independence. It's not about ensuring stability. It's about production, export, sales, trade. Those are the things that keep economies going. When the U.S. is having problems with China, it's not because of politics. They are fighting because their economic space is being taken by China, and the U.S. is unhappy about it. You know, When the EU is having problems with another country, it's not because of politics. It's because their trade control is being interrupted by another country. But in Africa, when two countries, or when we are having a problem with another country, it's because we feel that somebody, uh, you know, we, the loans we want to collect, they are not giving us the loans. Oh, unfortunately. Uh, Otto then, David, uh, let's try to, to understand uh, uh, critically uh, this, uh, this point or this aspect of uh, defining uh, the agenda for the African continent. When talking earlier on uh, that should be in your first uh, intervention, you highlighted the sanctions made on uh, the uh, countries of the Sahel state, uh, Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso by ECOWAS, and also by uh, supposed Africa's number one institutional bloc, that is the African uh, Union. Now, faced with uh, the uh, the problems, what are some of the contestations that will come as a result of the fact that even the African Union does not, uh, as a body, recognize uh, uh, the the milestone or the revolutionary act uh, met it or mended by the uh, uh, leaders of the Sahel states. Yes, I think you're very correct. I mean, for the African Union, uh, which is uh, you know uh, the uh, the body that is supposed to uh, hold the entire continent together. Um, you know, in a democratic uh, dispensation, they see whatever the uh, the Sahel states uh, do um, as you know um, as a result of uh, an unconstitutional move. Um, you know, so it's more or less saying that you know uh, uh, you cannot benefit from uh, you know uh, a military coup d'état, irrespective uh, of what you build upon that. Uh, the African Union will not recognize. Um, the uh, alliance of Sahelian states. Uh, it, it may not even recognize um, uh, the confederation because, you know, perhaps for the African Union, uh, it is um, a product uh, of a military coup d'etat. But it, it is not up to the African Union uh, to recognize, um, you know, uh, the alliance of Sahelian states. Uh, again, it is not up to uh, to echo us to recognize them uh, because, of course. You know, becoming a member of ECOWAS, you know, is something that is done, um, you know, free by a country. So a country can decide uh, that, you know, it wants to leave ECOWAS any time. It can decide that it, it doesn't even want to become a member of the African Union. You know, so uh, these are all um, independent decisions. Um, but I think the challenge uh, that the African Union faces at this point in time 
um, is that, you know, despite the, uh, the suspension that, um, you know, it meted out uh, on these countries that took power unconstitutionally, um, you know, uh, they are still, they are forging ahead. You know, they, they are progressing uh, in terms of, you know, how they want to govern their country. So uh, it, it will be a disappointment uh, for the African Union. Um, but, you know, the, the, the truth of the matter is that, you know, the African Union has also failed uh, to take sanctions uh, when, you know, countries, uh, their leaders have, you know, failed to uh, honor uh, the, um, the strength of the Constitution by either trying to change the Constitution halfway yeah. uh, during or before elections. Uh, some countries have decided to not allow opposition leaders to run free and fairly. Um, others have been able to, um, you know, uh, uh, play some very serious tricks on the electoral process to ensure that elections are not free, uh, they are not fair. Um, so um, the African Union finds itself in a very challenging position um, because, of course, uh, it still understands that the doctrine uh, of the sovereignty of the state applies. So okay. it cannot intervene uh, in a position where a state makes an independent decision. So it is up to uh, the, the alliance of the Sahelian state members to establish um, some kind of uh, an alliance that is going to benefit uh, the people of those countries. Only the people of Niger, Burkina Faso, and Mali can take a decision uh, to say to their leaders, we don't want to belong to any confederation. Yeah. As long uh, as majority of the people support, and I use the word majority, um, you know, deliberately, as long as majority of the, the people are seen uh, to support uh, the, um, the move of these uh, revolutionary leaders, mm -hmm. um, then, of course, you know, it will become uh, the business of the day. But my question has always been, what happens if these leaders are to hand over power to democratically elected leaders? So it, it, it then becomes a situation whereby, you know, um, it's um, whether this is going to be sustainable uh, or not. Um, so let's watch and see. But for the African Union, their hands are tied. Um, and the last thing that the African Union wants is to see that members begin to leave the union on the basis that, you know, um, they are not supporting the establishment of alliances, which, of course, you know, are independent of the decision of the leaders who rule these countries. And uh, that is where the problematic lies, because uh, we are in a time of, uh, you know, changing uh, dynamics. And I, I think uh, nations uh, across the globe are re-strategizing to be able uh, to, to map uh, their own uh, position in uh, the uh, uh, connected world. We know the world at this moment is, is facing an interconnected uh, uh, problems, and people are strategizing. What is the place of the African Union? Is it about being afraid of, you know, of losing members? Or is it about uh, taking those uh, necessary drastic uh, uh, decisions uh, that will uh, defend the sovereignty of the continent as a whole? Uh, this actually comes uh, to the, the question on uh, the, uh, you know, a, a memorandum of understanding. I don't know if uh, Dr. Rashid is back. A memorandum of understanding was signed uh, that should be on the, the 3rd of December of 1970, which paved a way for the uh, Lip uh, Taco uh, Goma Region Integration Development Authority. And I think this is uh, the interception between uh, Mali, Niger, and uh, uh, Burkina Faso. Uh, so now, with this, I will note that uh, the fact that Africa is uh, uh, disintegrated is also one of the reasons uh, we are facing the problems you highlighted. Dr. Uh, Rashid uh, Perboa. So now, with this uh, memorandum of 1970, how can uh, the African Union as a body uh, align with uh, the uh, philosophy or ideas uh, of uh, the uh, Alliance of Sahel States for the common good of the continent? Well, um, it might be strange, but I think that there is basically nothing wrong with this, uh, the formation of IES 
Um, I want to see Africa reorganize itself. And um, the fact that they have done so is a first step towards redefining who they are and moving towards um, an achievement of a kind that will give them the kind of leverage and respect in the, in the Committee of Nations. So for me, um, talking about how that is going to have a direct influence on each of them will depend on what, what targets, what strategies they place before themselves. And I, and I suppose that they should understand the new concept of the world today. They should understand the issues that are playing out and, and, and finding Africa in a space that, um, you know, is very difficult for them to operate without being dependent. I, I like to see them work in a manner that should aim towards real liberation of Africa. I want to see them contradict ECOWAS because ECOWAS is not doing what it professes to do. And they're doing exactly what will help them so other countries can see it. Even when eventually they regroup ECOWAS in ECOWAS, they should be able to influence ECOWAS in We lost uh, him again. Uh, you may want to comment on the question, uh, uh, Otto uh, David, uh, looking at how uh, this uh, Memorandum of Understanding of 1970 is uh, important uh, in the decisions taken, uh, taken by the uh, leaders of the uh, uh, Sahel region for the common good of uh, the people of their respective nations and particular and in general of uh, the African continent. So I think it's important to, uh, uh, to, to remember that, uh, uh, again, as my, my co-panelist uh, mentioned, um, th these countries are independent, uh, and, and they, can, uh, they can establish um, any form of alliance sure. uh, as they so wish, um, including the alliance of, of Sahelian states. You know, I think the big question now is how does the alliance um, you know, uh, progress towards um, uh, the liberation uh, of the people of these nations away from uh, the, um, uh, the stronghold that, you know, the colonial states, you know, have had on them. Uh, I think that's what the ordinary Burkina Bay, uh, the ordinary Malian and the ordinary Nigerian will want to, um, you know, have as, you know, an impact. They want to see, okay, we've established an alliance of Sahelian states. How does this help us in uh, dealing with the insecurity that, you know, um, is ongoing within our country? Mm -hmm. How does it elevate our economic uh, situation, our social situation? How, how does it lead to uh, development within the country? You know, so these are some of the, um, uh, the, the very critical uh, uh, questions, you know, that, you know, these, um, uh, the, the people of these countries will be asking their leaders. Yeah. Um, but, but also, I think the most important uh, of political question is, okay, you know, they, there is an establishment of uh, a, a Sahelian alliance, a confederation. How do these leaders want to continue with their leadership? You know, do they want to remain uh, as, you know, military leaders? Do they want to transition into um, a democratic setting? Um, how long do they want to stay in power? Um, so they've got to ask all these questions, because ultimately, mm -hmm. um, if they decide to um, you know, um, you know, engage themselves in any transformative, um, you know, political uh, system. Maybe you know, if they want to run as um, democratic leaders, then of course, you know, they then face a different ball game, because you know, uh, if you want to run as a democratic um, leader, then of course you have to abide by the uh, the principles of democracy, which means you uh, you need to have an independence of the judiciary. Uh, the legislature and the executive. So it, it will not be uh, a military style of governance. You know, so it, it therefore means that they have to come up with a plan uh, on how to run a different kind of democracy uh, that is perhaps not aligned to uh, the intricacies of the West. Um, you know, then how do they manage that uh, with the, uh, the, the, the fact that, you know, these countries still depend on the, uh, the fiscal economy of some of the Western states? 
uh, they depend on the money, uh, which, you know, comes from the West. You know, they depend on, uh, uh, you know, some of the, the assistance that they can get from the likes of the International Monetary Fund. Mm -hmm. So how do they find alternative ways uh, of, you know, running the country or the confederation that will benefit uh, the ordinary man in the street who wants to make sure that they have education, uh, you know, sure. their children can you know, a play around without fear of being attacked by, um, you know, terrorist groups or criminals? How do they want to make sure that the economy is in such a way that it can be beneficial for uh, the Taco Goma region of Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger? So it's a huge um, endeavor, and it has different parts and different compartments um, that these leaders need to look into very carefully. And those compartments you know, still depend on themselves. How do they want to continue their leadership? Are they still going to be dressed in military fatigues? Um, you know, are they still going to be able to, um, you know, sustain themselves in, in an environment of fear? Mm -hmm. uh, because these military leaders are afraid that, you know, someone else is going to do what they did to whoever was in power before them. You know, remember the Liptako Goma region has one of the highest number of you know, a military coup d'etat you know, within that region. Yeah. So the question is, who else are they afraid of, you know, besides ECOWAS? You know, what is the enemy within? You know, who is planning to take power from them? So it's a huge challenge, you know, um, that, you know, they are facing ahead of time mm -hmm. that moves beyond, you know, even the establishment of the Confederation of States, you know, within the Sahel. Absolutely. And that is where actually the problematic lies. And I think a, a better strategy will answer uh, the question if the, the, the uh, maybe uh, the will of the people or the interest of the people is the reason for the formation of the confederation, for the formation or the, the, the decisions taken it, it, uh, in line with what the people need then I, I think we're already having uh, the answer that whosoever is at the helm will put the interest of the people uh, first. Uh, and uh, we continue to elaborate uh, in the same perspective because, you know, on the 1st of July 2024, 20, uh, the transitional government of uh, the captain, uh, Captain Ibrahim Tuari of uh, Burkina Faso will come to an end. Now the question is, if in case he steps down, what will be the implications on the uh, uh, confederation uh, if the uh, the leader that comes in uh, does not actually align with the objective or the uh, uh, philosophy of the uh, uh, the alliance of Sahel states? Well, I think first of all, he's not going to step down. Um, you know, come uh, this. Um timetable. Uh, there is going to be some level of perhaps uh, uh, this is going to be postponed, um, or um, they are possibly looking at taking the shape of Chad. Uh, remember the um, uh, General Mohammed uh, Idris uh, Jr. took uh, power unconstitutionally from uh, the, um, uh, the passing away of uh, you know, President Idris Dhabi. Um, he established a transitional government and then simply removed his military fatigue. Um, and won his civilian, um, you know, clothing and, you know, represented himself to run as president, and he won. So if these leaders, you know, are considering pleasing the world that sees democracy as the, uh, the global recognized system of governance, if they want to please the international community, uh, they want to please the likes of the African Union, uh, they want to please ECOWAS, mm -hmm. Um, then, of course, perhaps if they also want to please some of the voices within their countries who believe in democracy, I think what is going to happen is they are simply going to, you know, reincarnate themselves as, you know, uh, civilian leaders. They will stand elections and they will possibly win these elections and will continue to rule the countries as, you know, military men in democratic settings. Set. You know, so that is what I see as the most likely outcome. Um, but, you know, I think very strongly that these countries, and I'm talking about Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger, yeah. are going through what I call the consolidation era. The consolidation era is the period in which 
you take power unconstitutionally, you need to make sure that you stabilize yourself. You need to make sure that you are not threatened uh, by someone else who might want to do the same thing, mm -hmm. uh, or maybe um, a counter coup d'etat. And, and then once you have established, you know, yourself, you know, making sure that you have consolidated uh, power amongst uh, all the security agencies, then you can move towards the stage uh, of having some kind of an understanding of, you know, how you can transition from, you know, a military leader to a democratic setting. Right now, these countries are not ready for that. Um, they, they are not ready to, uh, to hand over power. They are not ready to to have any elections at this point in time. Um, so perhaps they're still waiting uh, for a couple of months or so, a couple of years to, you know, to a point where they can actually believe that, you know, they have the right, um, you know, atmosphere, they have the right uh, mechanisms, and, and then they can select at that particular point, you know, to, to run a democratic system of governance or to transition to to, uh, to democracy, but they will not hand over power. Um, you know, the last thing that someone who takes power by force mm -hmm. will do. Uh, just to, to add, of course, uh, to what uh, Otto David uh, was highlighting, uh, uh, this shows uh, the uh, uh, complexities of uh, the uh, uh, situations in uh, the Sahel region, particularly in Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger. Should uh, the uh, military government in play uh, in place uh, uh, quit at uh, this particular moment? What becomes uh, the future of these countries, particularly and uh, the African? continent uh, in uh, uh, in uh, general and uh, it brings us again uh, to the analysis which we are made uh, on a country like uh, uh, the Russian Federation during the past elections that uh, the population of a uh, womanly voted uh, their leader president Vladimir Putin uh, because according to some of them it is uh, it will be unwise to, to ensure uh, a change in uh, leadership at the time that uh, the continent or the country is facing uh, some sort of security uh, challenges. Uh, this was uh, referred, uh, referring to the, uh, uh, the disagreement uh, uh, between uh, the Russian Federation and uh, Ukraine, and also particularly because it's more of a proxy war at uh, the particular uh, moment. Uh, I see you back uh, with us, uh, uh, Otto David. You may want to continue with the analysis. Yes, I mean, as I said to you, it all depends on the uh, uh, the decision of the, uh, the the people of Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger, how they want to see um, the the government in place transition. Um, but the truth is that, you know, in order to test that, you know, you've got to have an election. You, you've got to put up some kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, maybe uh, a referendum to decide on whether to have... Uh, these military leaders to stay in power as they are, or perhaps to have them transition or into a democratic setting. But, you know, the, the, the truth is that, you know, uh, they, they would want at some point uh, to, to, uh, to transition uh, into a democratic setting. Because Point that is what they, they promised, um, you know, there are some of the, uh, all the, um, the electorates that at some point Mm -hmm. They will add, um, you know, the um, uh, the process of a transitional government into place. So um, we are still waiting to see. I want to charge my phone. If oh. these governments, you know, are uh, able to. Please, can you mute your mic, uh, Dr. Rashid? We can get uh, interruption from your end. Uh, but I don't have the thing to. Okay. Dr. Okay, Rashid, thanks. please. Uh, there's an interruption from your end. Uh, can you mute yourself when you are not uh, talking? Thank you. Otto David, please, can we continue? Yeah, so um, so it, it all depends, again, as I said, on the, um, uh, the, the people of Niger and the people of the, uh, the, the, the Confederation of Sahelian States, you know, how they want uh, the, um, uh, the, the so-called uh, uh, revolutionary leaders, uh, you know, some, some call them beneficiaries of coup d'etat. The people have to make a decision, you know, how do they want them to continue ruling? Uh, do they want them to become, um, you know, to hand over power, you know, to a, 
a democratic leader or democratic, you know, transitional leadership? Do they want them to continue being uh, in power to, in order for them to stabilize the country? Um, but I think uh, from, you know, watching at the body language of uh, uh, these leaders in the Sahel, I don't see any indication that they will want to hand over power to any democratic leader um, in the nearest one or two years. I think, you know, right now they're still trying to stabilize their position. Yeah. Um, even when they do decide to hand over power, I see a scenario where they will want to take part in elections themselves. You know, they will want to be elected as democratic leaders, and they will want to continue with um, uh, ruling the countries on this basis. So um, that's my prediction. Um, I don't see any other options, you know, from my angle at this point in time. Uh, just to add uh, that sometimes uh, such decisions are needed uh, to preserve the sovereignty of uh, the country or uh, to prevent the country from going back uh, to the uh, slums and and we, you know for sure that uh, uh, there is uh, uh, you know uh, the, the the geopolitical competition across Africa particularly in areas of that uh, actually harbor uh, minerals that are very important uh, uh, for the other world uh, in court. Coming back to you, uh, Dr. Rashid, uh, praying that all is uh, well with the connection. How can uh, the uh, Alliance of Sahel States now effectively uh, navigate uh, diplomatic engagement with neighboring countries, uh, international stakeholders, and uh, uh, particularly uh, global bodies uh, uh, to promote regional stability and cooperation in the uh, Sahel region under the auspices of the Confederation of the Alliance of Sahel States. Is Dr. Rashid with us, please? Again. Can you ask your question again? Yeah, we're looking at how the, uh, uh, the Alliance of Sahel States can effectively navigate uh, the diplomatic engagement with countries, uh, neighboring countries, international uh, bodies or stakeholders, and uh, uh, in order to promote regional stability and uh, cooperation in the Sahel region that will in turn uh, write a good economic trajectory for the region as a whole. Well, first of all, I, I do agree with my co-panelists that they are in a foundational stage of establishing themselves and convincing everybody that the chosen, what they have chosen is viable is, and, 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 and has value. Um, it should be sustainable and it should have, they should have some confidence in dealing with the system and in dealing with the world. If that foundation stage is not established, it will be difficult to project themselves into um, the Committee of Nations and to deal with ECOWAS and to diplomatically deal with other countries successfully. Right now, there's still a stream of doubts as to whether what they have done has a sustainable value or not. So essentially, they have a long way to go. They will have to establish themselves very strongly and they will have to transit into being dependent, you know, on themselves and uh, being able to convince ECOWAS that this is a different kind of organization and which is not a rival to them, but which can have a cooperation and understanding in terms of their economic uh, cooperation and political cooperation. ECOWAS should not, is not going to see it easily accommodating them because that would have meant that other countries can do the same and still go free. And coup d'etat will become a thing of the, an event that should take place uh, by other countries or by other individuals who would have thought that, well, doing a coup can be successful. There's a place to align yourself. And then, you know, being revolutionary is acceptable and democracy is going to be uh, transgressed and it will be okay, violating the ECOWAS charter. So. I, but it is also impossible for them to live without diplomacy, without extending their, co their cooperation with other countries, and without seeing that uh, they are not alone, because no country can exist by themselves without cooperating with others. 
So it's essential, it's critical, it's part of the the the, the transgression into sorry, it's, it's part of the uh, the progression into being um, independent and being able to um, you know maneuver out of all the intricacies of difficulties that they are facing. Mm -hmm. So I, I suppose that the essential thing for them to do is to convince themselves that what they are doing is the best. To go ahead and convince ECOWAS that ECOWAS is not in danger by the kind of configuration they have made. And thirdly, they have to make sure that in extending themselves into the wider world, uh, they should be accepted as 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 uh, as an organized body that is not a threat to democracy, that is not a threat to the uh, the, the 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 economic order that is within the space where ECOWAS and themselves exist. So if they are able to go through all this, it is possible for them to use diplomacy to reach any level. Mm -hmm. Let me warn that with all the things they are doing, they are still not an economic power. They still depend so much on the external. They cannot withstand an aggression, a foreign aggression, when uh, the military is threatened. Even in ECOWAS itself, ECOWAS, if ECOWAS is on them, they won't be able to fight on for one month with the kind of um, weapons they have. So they are, they, they are only the only option left with them is to strengthen their diplomatic links and to strengthen their ability to uh, curve ways into the, uh, the, 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 the the other countries, and especially ECOWAS. Oh. And thankfully, they are looking at Russia as a very good friend. I can see Russia being a senior brother can give them the kind of leverage that they would have. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we lost you again, uh, Dr. Rashid. And uh, of course, uh, I was to uh, to bring this uh, other question to you. If you can uh, hear me still, uh, sometimes we say uh, that uh, radical changes necessitate uh, radical measures. Talking earlier on, you highlighted uh, some points as to why uh, the uh, three Sahelian states, Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso, had to uh, quit uh, the economic uh, uh, block uh, of the West African uh, state. And now, from your, 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 your statement regarding uh, the fact that uh, these uh, leaders or these countries are not yet uh, uh, military strong to face uh, external infringement or attack. Uh, so the question uh, this time around is, you know, it's still too early to, to maybe uh, make uh, some conclusions as to how these uh, countries can be uh, able to withstand external threat or threats that have to do uh, with the uh, sovereignty of the respective uh, uh, nations. Uh, now, th the question is, how can we uh, put the interest of uh, the continent first? You know, when these leaders left ECOWAS is because of the infringement, particularly I, I know that the funding uh, that was promised by the United States and also the fact that French has infiltrated uh, some of the countries in the ECOWAS using it to uh, further expand its sphere of influence across Africa, uh, actually uh, one of uh, some of the reasons that led to this drastic decisions, uh, decision taken by uh, the leaders of the Sahel region. Now, so what do you think is that right uh, uh, diplomatic move uh, that can actually, uh, you know, impact uh, or uh, bring about uh, diplomatic dynamics in uh, the ECOWAS region, uh, particularly, and uh, in Africa in general? Oh, well, um, you have a long question, but my understanding is that how will they be able to maneuver their way into um, the scheme of diplomacy in Africa, given the situation they find themselves? They are fighting um, a present-day infiltration. Yes. Um, I, I think that it is about, first of all, their individual commitment, as I, I mentioned earlier, and also about their ability to um, to, to straight away follow the memorandum of understanding they are working with. 
and ensure that they stand in a situation where they are needed. If you are a country or an organized group, that does not make yourself indispensable to the needs of others. Your ability to exist doesn't matter to anybody. But where you make yourself independent, I mean, sorry, it, uh, you, you, you make yourself needed, you can ensure that you are needed. Then people move towards you. So essentially, they have to work towards a situation where they establish some kind of indispensability in the way they interact with ECOWAS and the world. They will have to then establish a strong diplomatic cooperation. That is, that is going to come without the threat of war or the threat of disruption of economic power. Absolutely. And then they have to strengthen the need for them to have what it needs for the West to come to them, rather than what it needs for them to go to the West. They should establish a situation what, you know, that will compel the West to come to them, to accept them as they are, and to also cooperate with Russia, which is a power willing to go extra length with them okay. in, in helping them fight against terrorism and in ensuring that uh, they maintain their sovereign the sovereign, um, you know, positions. Mm -hmm. So it is a tall order for them. It's, it's important for them also to note that in this scheme, they must move away from ensuring that they are a military power and want to remain so. There must be a transition into a civil rule, which is critical. You cannot depend on military power and travel along with it. Because if a military power rules and then that military, the, the leader of that military power goes on to fail in continuing his rule. Doesn't mean we should go in to take another military power. Transition, power transition must be streamlined. And it has to be done in such a manner that there must be cooperation with the military, with the, with the civilian population. It must come. Uh, I, I think uh, we should have uh, a concluding uh, uh, statement from you, uh, Otto or David. We have uh, about uh, four minutes uh, uh, to, to be together. I would love to have your comment uh, uh, regarding uh, what uh, Prof, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Rashid uh, presented, particularly on the fact that ECOWAS uh, uh, will be afraid that some countries will follow the example of these countries in the Sahel region and uh, also take Take some drastic decisions. Do you think uh, we should uh, uh, look at maybe uh, what ECOWAS wants at this particular moment when the uh, sovereignty of the country, especially economic sovereignty of a state, is at stake? I think it's important to understand that uh, you know ECOWAS does not want a disruption uh, of you know the 15-member bloc. Mauritania, you know, had left the bloc. Sure. Um, you know, they don't want any other member to leave. And this is why, uh, despite, um, you know, ECOWAS suspending all three or four members of the uh, regional bloc, they then realized that they had made a catastrophic error uh, by promising to uh, to launch a military, uh, a, a, you know, invasion into, um, into Niger to restore President Bazoum. That itself had driven uh, these countries to establish... Um, you know, this alliance of Sahelian states, which now uh, is being pushed towards uh, a confederation of uh, the Sahel state. So ECOWAS understands that, you know, uh, its own action um, has led to uh, the potential uh, that these members will not return uh, to ECOWAS, you know, and possibly uh, a scenario where uh, these members will then belong to two groups, uh, two um, economic groups at the same time, belonging to ECOWAS, while not actually um, obliging themselves to the re regulations of ECOWAS, but also establishing the alliance of Sahelian states. You know, so uh, it's all down to how they want to play this geopolitics, which is ongoing. But I think, uh, from my point of view, I don't see ECOWAS, you know, trying to establish any kind of a military threat um, against um, the three member states of the Niptako Goma region. Uh, there is no appetite uh, in the region. When you talk to the citizens of this region, there is no appetite for 
a military confrontation between African states. I mean, it's just a disaster, um, you know, and, and it will be catastrophic for African states to confront each other on the basis of some external pressure, um, either from the West or the East. You know, so uh, I think that, you know, the what we are experiencing at this point in time is the military and revolutionary leaders, whichever you want to call them, uh, in Mali and Burkina Faso, looking towards consolidating uh, power dynamics, ensuring that the, um, the power structures, you know, are stabilized, ensuring that they can bring some kind of uh, uh, stability within the economic, political, um, and, and military, um, you know, uh, governance within that region. And then, you know, at that point in time, they may now decide uh, if they want to continue as democratic leaders, they may decide to join ECOWAS or rejoin um, ECOWAS as ECOWAS has requested them to rejoin. Um, you know, but for now, I think, you know, ECOWAS is panicking. ECOWAS is panicking because, of course, it does understand that there is a potential that other member states who may decide, you know, to launch a military coup d'etat now have friends, um, you know, in the Sahel that they can simply um, join them uh, and defend against any possibility that, you know, ECOWAS could launch um, a military um, uh, invasion uh, to restore democracy. So uh, it is a big problem uh, for ECOWAS. It is a big problem for the African Union because, of course, the African Union you know, has, you know, uh, the, you know, gives the first right of, you know, um, conflict resolution to uh, to regional bodies like ECOWAS and ECAS and the rest. So uh, it's important to know that, you know, it's a very critical time in the, uh, in the history of ECOWAS. But ECOWAS needs to fix its house. You know, it needs to understand that some of the challenges that ECOWAS has faced uh, is that it has kept silent uh, when member states, you know, have changed the constitution uh, when member states have, you know, used fraudulent means to win elections, uh, when member states have overstayed in power uh, and, you know, locked up opposition leaders, you know, and then ECOWAS does nothing. So um, if one coup uh, is bad enough, then the other must also be bad and must also be condemned. So as long as ECOWAS does not, you know, play the game of neutrality, if they don't play the game of one standard, instead of double standard, then I think ECOWAS will face a huge challenge in years to come in terms of its membership. That can transcend to the African continent as a whole. Uh, maybe uh, uh, this will be a milestone towards uh, uh, bringing uh, that drastic uh, drastic reform of that the African Union has at as a body. Thank you so much and do have a lovely time in the company of Program Sun for you, Media Africa. Thank you, Robin.